Ahoy hoy gang, if this is your first time with us, welcome! And if you're joining us from a previous video, hey hey, we love to see it and I hope you're doing well. It's season 3! If season 2 was about growth, season 3 is about moving on. About making peace with our past. Season 3 is just another super high quality season that gives us more of that good stuff that we love. And so I have to ask those three age old questions. What worked? What failed? What cosmic mutinies will be curtailed? Let's see as we ski through season 3. After Katya yeets Barry off a rooftop in a futile attempt to stop him, Archer spirals and ends up running off to work in the South Pacific and basically just sleep with new brides and drink his days away. Mallory knows only one man can hunt him down and bring him home. Legendary adventurer Rip Riley, played by voice acting icon Patrick Warburton. It's kind of funny. Last season we had Peter Serafinowicz and now we have Patrick Warburton. The series is riddled with ticks. That's, that's, that's all I'm saying. You click the thumbnail, you knew what this was. Well, Rip goes to get Archer and throws him in a seaplane. Archer attacks Rip and proceeds to think that Autopilot just automatically knows how to get home. I do appreciate how Archer just has this sliding scale of intelligence, much like Stan and American Dad. There's going to be things he is just not going to understand, especially things like flying a plane. The plane crashes, Archer scarfs down their rations, and then lo and behold, they get picked up by pirates to be taken back to the pirate island. The pirate captain on the ship is played by G. Lee, who would also play other roles throughout the series. Archer shows off his watch, allowing him and Riley to take over the boat, and Archer becomes the new pirate king. He also gets a translator in Pirate Captive Noah, played by Arrested Development Wonderfunk and comedy legend David Cross. So yeah, Archer is king of the pirates. Honestly, if you can, watch all of Heart of Arkness in one go. It genuinely feels more like a one-hour movie where there's some significant padding in the middle. Part 1 isn't bad, but obviously you can't judge it unless you compare it to the others. The intro of Rip Riley is great, and it makes sense that Archer would still be adamant about not going home. The three-parter is just... tricky to talk about, but it'll be more obvious the deeper we go. Though if I did have to rate it just on the jokes, I would have to give Heart of Arkness number 1 an 8 out of 10. We're still very much in great Archer writing, and it still shows they had ideas that they wanted to get across. Heart of Arkness is a creative idea, make no mistake. It's just, well, you'll see. So Archer is king of the pirates, and understandably, he parties most hardy. The only problem being, he parties too much and pillages too little, and the people start to get a little uneasy. When your men are starting to get hungry, but you set up a lacrosse league, let them eat cake, you know? And this Pirate Island Rebellion is led by Bucky, played by one of the absolute legends of the very idea of media. This season is packed with guest stars. Right out the gate, we already have David Cross and Patrick Warburton, but Bucky is played by James Hong, arguably one of the most influential acting icons of the modern age. At 95 years young, the man has been in over 400 productions and four Kung Fu Panda movies. You know James Hong. You've heard his voice before countless times. He's been a part of classic pieces of media from Blade Runner and Big Trouble in Little China to Sweet Life on Deck and Jackie Chan Adventures. He's low pan, and if I can talk about James Hong, I'm gonna. And spoilers, I'm gonna gush about George Takei this season too. Why can I go this in depth into a man that helped shape your and my media diets? Because part two is just a kind of steady, not flatline, but normal pulse, I guess? Cyril gets drunk and locks himself out of an account he rerouted all of Isis's funds to in a drunken fit of rage. He and Pam hooked up, so in order to retrace his steps, he has to sleep with Pam again and recreate it. Oh, and Archer, Noah, and Rip Riley get thrown in prison. Eh. Ray and Lana go to rescue them, and Ray is actually incredibly professional, it's Lana that gets them caught and thrown in with Archer and the gang. Woo, that's part two! That's really the question when you look at part two and three. Is there enough content you could cut from both of these episodes to just make this a two-parter? Like, they cover so much ground in a part one. Archer is found. They crash a seaplane. They're lost at sea, got picked up by pirates. Archer becomes the pirate king. All in one episode. Part two is just kind of nothing. And then part three speeds to a conclusion. This isn't the rise and fall of conflict, this is the heir's rock of narrative resolution. 
it's fine, but I, I just don't know. Part two just kind of brings down the whole thing. It, it's like a six out of 10 in between like two really good eight out of tens. I mean, they fight. Noah is a weenie hut junior, Mallory is waiting to hear from the pirates and has to negotiate with them, and the gang gets ripped to a helicopter and they manage to fly themselves out. You know all the points it has to hit and it hits them beat for beat. I think it's important that Ray and Lana are there to sort of get Archer back into his groove, but overall it feels like it's packing up after a fun little adventure more than anything. That being said, I would honestly say when Archer is fighting Bucky for the gun and the sat phone, we actually do get some character out of Archer. Ray gets shot right in the stomach, but Lana gets shot in the leg and he goes ballistic. You can see he still very much cares about her even if he's made her life difficult time and time again. He already lost Katya, he can't lose her. Rip gets a spoon to the eye, but I don't know, doesn't really matter, I guess. Maybe it will later, I don't wanna spoil myself. Hasn't mattered through season seven though, so eh. The final helicopter ride off the island feels even more akin to say MASH or the end of a war movie than a weekend at Bernie's. Everyone is injured and tired. They've exhausted literally everything just to get away. Cruel reality crashes in on Archer's Paradise. Heart of Arkness is a lot. Again, I don't know if it needed to be three parts, but I definitely believe it needed to happen. We needed to see Archer effectively get his groove back. David Cross makes Noah effectively insufferable, and honestly, Patrick Warburton feels pushed to the side by the vocal talent at work. And that's not a bad thing. He's playing a side character. The actors have strong enough charisma and delivery that they can keep the focus on Archer, Lana, and Ray. It's those small things that elevate Archer. It's greater than the sum of its parts, and Heart of Arkness feels right at the end of the day. By the time you're on the other side of it, you're glad you watched it. Heart of Arkness is a longer Jimmy Timmy Power Hour length, 8 out of 10. Now, if we want to talk about charismatic actors that can hold their own, there's really no better episode. Some Cubans are after Archer, but that's not important. See, the episode opens with Archer flirting with a girl at a bar, but then he gets into a fight with an older stranger who proceeds to hand him his super sleuthing ass. And who is this silver-haired powerhouse? Only one of the most prolific names in the game, and the man that brought Thatherton of Thatherton Fuels to life, Burt Reynolds. Played by, you guessed it, Burt Reynolds. Archer is understandably starstruck and can't get over the fact that his childhood hero is standing right in front of him. Oh, and he's dating Mallory. Archer now hates his childhood hero as Pam and Cheryl froth. It's okay, unsub, I don't blame you. So Archer decides to kidnap Burt Reynolds so he can't take Mallory to a film premiere. They bond over a proposed Gator sequel, Ray is in a wheelchair after being shot last episode, Cubans attack, Burt Reynolds does cool Burt Reynolds stuff, and saves the day because of course he does, he's Burt Reynolds. It's, I don't know, it's very tricky to do an episode like this without it seeming, for lack of a better term, masturbatory. You really think Burt Reynolds could do half the stuff he's done in his movies? No, of course not. Man's an icon, absolutely, and he did do a lot of his own stunts, but any human being can only do so much. And I say this having grown up on Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise movies, but Archer has deified Burt Reynolds so much that if you got him in the show, either he's just a complete and total actor with no skills that disappoints Archer, or he's the larger-than-life icon that inspired a young, lonely kid. Which would be more fun to watch, it's pretty obvious. Bird's delivery is fantastic, and I think him having that Archer-style dialogue is what makes this work for me. They don't try and make him all these different things. He's literally just Burt Reynolds now featuring an action grip and shotguns. It's a fun episode that totally makes you blank on Heart of Arkness because, yeah, you just watched Archer team up with his mom's new boyfriend, Burt Reynolds. Season 3, here we go, all gas, no brakes. The Man from Jupiter is a Cloud 9 out of 10. Please, please don't watch Cloud9, it is not one of Burt's best. Archer, Lana, and Cyril are sent out to catch a Colombian drug lord since Ray can't go on missions anymore. Fun fact, they call Ray Ironside several times throughout this little arc. Ironside is actually in reference to an old 1960s series, Ironside, about a detective in a wheelchair. It would go on for eight seasons and would have a spinoff as well as a backdoor pilot for a medical show. It would even get a remake in 2013 that was hailed as one of the absolute worst shows NBC had ever put out. It's if you ate flour paste for 45 minutes while watching paint dry. It was truly a nothing show. 
The Colombian drug lord is actually Roman Calzado, played by Joaquim de Almeida, who played Father Domingo in the very excellent other FX series, Shogun. See? All connected. Anyway, Cyril is horrible at all the actual violent parts of being a field agent, but he's actually incredibly talented at faking his way through being a drug lord's accountant and tries to rescue Archer and Lana with his acting. Honestly, this is tragical history, but better. Cyril gets to show he does have skills of his own, even if he was bungling at the beginning. The key difference being, he wasn't the full inciting incident. He's just there as part of the team. Roman decides to hunt the world's deadliest game and lets Archer and Lana run in the jungle as he and Cyril hunt them for sport. The B story? Isis is going to start drug testing and so Krieger helps Pam, Cheryl, and Ray detox with special tea that makes them trip balls as their very realities break around them and drives them to insanity. AKA just another day at the office. Again, I love when everyone is doing something and they really do make sure all the characters are busy. It's a fun touch, and to see the animation slowly warp and melt around them shows that they are getting more and more experimental. We're going to see a lot more motion as the show goes on that doesn't necessarily work, but when you see those sort of peel-aways, it's stuff that you might have seen in Frisky Dingo here or there, but they've been polishing it all this time. El Contador is a fantastically paced and properly deducted 9 out of 10. Train episode, train episode, train episode, train episode. Who doesn't love a good train episode, huh? Isis is tasked with getting a Canadian domestic bad guy extradited before his buddies can save him. Kenny Bill Co. would be played by legendary Canadian trailer park boy, Rob Wells. Oh, you thought that was all you were getting? No, 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 don't you worry. John Paul Tremblay and Mike Smith also guest star as bounties, which like, as a TPB fan, that's a Trailer Park Boys fan, uh, this is just super fun to see, and I don't know, I found both shows around the same time, so it was a little crossover in my eyes. Oh, and there's George, one of the train conductors played by Dave Fennoy. Remember Howard in Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2? The pigeon guy, who you totally didn't cry when you listened to his story as you tried to get back, and like deep down you knew you weren't going to get back in time, and you ended up gutted. But no time to think about that. Kids with flamethrowers are attacking with like venom monsters. Woo! Well, Howard was played by Dave Fennoy. I don't know. He's just a really terrific voice actor that puts a lot of heart into everything he's in, and I get excited when I can recognize him now. Oh, and should mention this, not a big deal or anything, but Frank is played by Larry Murphy, friend of John Benjamin and frequent actor on Bob's Burgers who plays a little known character called Teddy. And I know usually I go all into the actors because the episode is boring or doesn't have much, but it's actually a really fun episode that has a ton of angles to love it from. Like Cheryl hooks her cars to the train and they decide to try and race to beat the other rich family's times. Archer gets to see Babu and has to fight Mounties and Kenny Bilko's men while Kenny calls him a racist because he thinks he killed George. There is no peace out of place with this episode and honestly, I just love it. There's so many moving gears, so many elements being juggled at the same time and they're all handled so expertly that by the end you're just genuinely satisfied. The Limited is a must-watch episode that really captures the unbridled spirit of Archer. The script is honestly perfect. Like, it's probably the best comedy script Archer has had since, like, El Sequestro right after Placebo Effect. It's a 10 out of 10 non-stop ride full of just, just perfect. I love it. It's Archer's birthday, and he thinks that everyone forgot and blew him off until his mom surprises him with a brand new car that he immediately falls in love with. He drives it around town, enjoys a refreshing apple juice from the drink console when he thinks it's bourbon, and parks it in a parking garage before walking off. When he comes back, he sees that it's been stolen and is in a desperate hunt to find it because he can't lose something precious to him again, not like his bike from when he was a kid. Not. Again. So Pam offers up that maybe the Yakuza have it, since she did some drift racing with them, and they go in guns a-blazing to get Archer's car back as Pam shows off her drifting skills. This Yakuza clan is led by Mr. Moto, played just, oh, just perfectly by acting legend and cultural icon, George Takei. We forget how well he can deliver serious lines and actually put on a gripping performance. We usually remember his acting as campy or very tongue-in-cheek, but this alongside his work in Yakuza 7, aka Like a Dragon? Oh. Oh, he's just a seasoned pro. 
The man didn't have to try this hard for a guest role on Archer, but he's a real star, so of course he brings that absolute Grand Funk Railroad Super DX high quality good stuff to this absolute seasonal smorgasbord of stardom. We find out Pam's nickname is White Pumpkin, that the Yakuza didn't take Archer's car, and that Mallory was actually the one that took it, just like his bike, and never returned either one or told Archer there was a lesson he was being taught, which left the poor guy with some pretty deep abandonment issues. It's fun and formative. This would also be the first appearance of Mr. Ford in Archer as Ford. Mr. Ford being someone Adam Reed actually lived next door to in Atlanta and was a frequent actor on Frisky Dingo and Exticles. We can't forget the Exticles. So if he sounds or looks familiar, that's that's why. It's because he is. I will say the episode takes a little bit to get going and does drag out the first act, but once it hits its stride, it just zooms right up till the end. Drift Problem is a multi-track drifting 8 out of 10. Ah, <sighs> sometimes, sometimes it's just good TV. Mallory calls Lana and Archer over as they find the Italian Prime Minister shot dead in a plastic bodysuit. Mallory had also been shot and so they have to hide the body. They call the gang over and a detective is called to investigate. Mallory tries to cover everything up as a fancy party. Krieger is able to take apart the body and they each take a piece of the Prime Minister to a different borough and dump it to ideally make a little smiley face. Aww. The last time we had a proper Mallory episode like this was back in Killing Utney, where a famed European politician bites it in Mallory's apartment and they have to dispose of the body. The old I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's surprising it happened twice. And that's where I'm supposed to go, and Killing Utney was just the better one, cue credits. But they're drastically different episodes, even if they have the same beats, and that's kind of what makes this episode so enchanting in such a unique way. There's this air of distrust that what you were told wasn't actually what happened. There's lingering tension through everything. In Killing Utney, it was largely arguably slapstick, but here there's a very real dead body they have to address. Turns out that, yeah, Mallory did it. She'd been meeting up with the Prime Minister for years and finally decided to enact her revenge for his killing of her lover, who may or may not have been Archer's father. She had harbored that grudge for over 30 years and played the long game. That is who Mallory Archer is. Episodes like this are very important because they really help hammer in that these characters have their own motivations that they don't have to spill right out the gate. Even though this series is very rooted in its dialogue, they use show don't tell masterfully. I don't know, Los Scandalo is one of those episodes you revisit and each time it just feels more and more placid. There's a tension, absolutely, but you never get the feeling there's this crime of passion. This was cold, calculated, and she did it seemingly without remorse. Mallory didn't get to where she is by playing by other people's rules, and it shows. Lo Scandalo is a well-dressed, finely restrained 9 out of 10. Lana and Archer get a report of a break-in at Isis. When they get there, oh look, there's old Ironsides walking around like nothing happened. Sure enough, Ray can walk again and he needs to go back home to the holler to help his brother with a corrupt cop who's ready to take his brother's bud growing facility by any means necessary. Lana agrees to cover for Ray while Archer and Cheryl go down to West Virginia with him to help bring some small town justice. They are almost run off the road by the sheriff on their way in, which really sets the tone for the episode. Sheriff Easy Ponder would be played by zombie hunting whistling specialist Michael Rooker. Easy having bullied Ray when they were kids, and so Ray goes to meet his brother and fortify the home front against him. Ray's brother, Randy, would be played by everyone's favorite nice guy, Jack McBriar, and his swinging bride, Janelle, would be played by Paula Malcolmson. And you did hear that right, Randy and Janelle try to swing, and Archer wants to sleep with Janelle, and yeah, it's, it's a whole thing. The sheriff comes in ready to drop the hammer on old Randy when Ray tries to stop him and finds out that his brother had been lying to him this entire time and the sheriff was actually on the up and up and was just trying to do his job and bring Randy to justice. Randy gets arrested and taken away while the sheriff flirts with Ray. It's a great Ray-focused episode elevated by the fact that Lana is covering for him. Ray has thrown himself into danger for his team time and time again and to get an episode like this really feels deserved for his character. And it also highlights one of the key reasons the show is as good as it is. Adam Reed knows how to voice act. 
When he's directing the crew, he's right there with them, bringing Ray to life. He knows what he's looking for and he knows how to articulate that because he's been on both sides of the microphone. If you're making a dialogue heavy or dialogue dependent show, it sounds common sense I know, but it helps when the head writers know how to talk. Like the episode was written and directed by Adam Reed with Adam Reed as the focus and it doesn't fall apart once. It's not because he wants to show off how cool he is, it's literally just because he knows how he wants the story told and it shows why he is a true master of his craft. This isn't some Neil Breen situation where he's doing it all for attention. Bloody Furlan is a down-home, super-sweet 9 out of 10. Archer wakes up hungover and unable to remember who he hooked up with the previous night, but it was the most mind-blowing sex of his entire life. He actually gets nervous and anxious when he tries to talk to his mystery woman, and it's Pam. Yeah, Archer is an unaware chubby chaser. Man likes some cushion for pushing, like some thick. I don't know, it's such a dumb juxtaposition of stories, but it works perfectly for the show. I will say this does also kind of feel like a two-parter in its own way, and this in the next episode could have very well have been, with minimal tweaks, a really solid season finale. Why do I say that? Oh, because Nikolai defects to the US and Mallory houses him in a safe house while Russia sends their best agent to take him out, who's, you guessed it, Roboberry. Archer gets lost in the sauce, tagging and bagging Pam, and Cheryl gets the Death Grip 2000 as a means of telling Barry where to find Nikolai. Sure enough, Nikolai is taken out and Archer may never know who his real father is now. I know that sounds super brief like I'm rushing through it, but only this show can present Archer having not only the internal conflict of wanting to know who his father is, especially if he's the head of the KGB, and struggling with the fact that when he sees Pam, he can't help but commence the jiggling. Humans are multifaceted creatures. Crossing over is brilliant and showcases what Archer does best. Sharp jokes and compelling narrative. It'd be a shame if the season finale gets overshadowed by this in the next episode. Doubt it'll happen. This is Archer we're talking about. Just saying, real shame. Crossing over is a Sir Mix-a-Lot approved 8 out of 10. Krieger has been building a cyborg of Katya, much to the horror and excitement of Archer, as he effectively just made a Terminator out of his dead fiancé. And, yeah, that's really kind of the episode already. Katya is back, but she's a robot. She still cares for Archer, but they have to deal with the complications of her being, you know, a robot. He tries to make it work and goes through with trying to set up a second wedding right there in the office with Ray's help. However, right as they're getting into the swing of things, Archer is destined to just not have nice things as Barry comes crashing in and he and Katya smash into each other like two mechanized kaiju. However, as they're smashing into one another, they uh, just start smashing each other. And just like that, Katya is leaving with Barry, leaving Archer heartbroken and alone. Katya feels like she's found someone she can be happy with, but as they ride off on the bus and everyone stares, deep down, neither is truly happy. She wouldn't be happy with Barry. Barry isn't even happy with Barry. They're cyborgs. The last scene didn't need to happen for the episode to be good, but that ending shot reminds you that these two were human once, and now they'll never be human again. There's a regret, a pain to what they've become. Katya not even consenting to what was done to her. Imagine waking up as a robot version of yourself after dying without ever telling someone that's what you wanted struggling to fit into your old life and having everything around you fall apart because you can't. Of course, she jumped at the first thing that seemed remotely familiar to her. Again, I wish we had more time with Katya before all this went down, but I do get it. It just makes these adventures have less impact than they could have had. Skin Game is a vibration featured 8 out of 10. It's part one of the season finale. Isis is contracted to help stop a mutiny at the International Space Station by the ISA. They're instructed by Commander Tony Drake, played by voice acting aficionado and Power Rangers regular Brian Cranston. It's true, not only was he Zordon in the 2017 live action movie, but he also played several villains in the original Mighty Morphin series. He'd also work on Macross Plus alongside Richard Epcar, who played Raiden in the Mortal Kombat games. Beautiful little series. Oh yeah, and he's Walter White and the dad and Malcolm in the middle in Godzilla and arguably one of the biggest names in Hollywood now or something. Yeah, the gang go to space. That's, that's the episode. They train for space, Cyril is a better pilot while Lana gets airsick, and the commander keeps prepping them for a mutiny where anything can go wrong. 
Alright gang, Screenwriting 101. If you want there to be a solid twist to a two-parter about your heroes going to space to stop a mutiny on a space station, what do you do? Do you have the person that warns them about the mutiny be in charge of the mutiny the entire time? Yeah, yeah, you do that. That's like, like why wouldn't you do that? Sure enough, Archer and the gang make it up to the base, put on their armor, go to stop the mutineers, only to find out that, yeah, Tony Drake is actually the bad guy who was looking to get more women to help him start a new space civilization. End of part one. Brian Cranston just plays Tony Drake so, I guess, maliciously or suspicious right out the gate that he just, he feels like he's the bad guy right from the get-go. He never feels like a true twist villain. I get it, but also, I feel like it would have benefited more from having less training gags and more one-on-one -on -one time for those cracks in his character to start forming. It's not bad by any means, just feels like a all-flash, no-bang, you know? But it can't really judge a two-parter just by one part. But hey, the commander did say Danger Zone, so that's cool! Part 2 I, I, can I, oh, can I be real with you, gang? This episode is important for literally, like, its last four minutes. The rest of it is just kind of whatever. That's it. 240 seconds. Tony Davis? Tony? Commander Davis? I don't even know what to call him. I don't, I don't care at this point. The mustached bad guy has given up on Earth and wants to start a space colony, so he wants to turn the women into breeding stock and build a prosperous space utopia with a dream and a case of, you know, the wily space madness. Lana seduces desperate soldiers, Cheryl declares herself queen of space, Pam is there, a lot of moving pieces. But then, something special happens. Barry takes a little one-man shuttle into space completely unprompted and goes to fight Archer on the space station. Archer, when given the chance to either save his friends or fight the man that took everything from him in an epic space battle, actually decides to go with his friends instead. I don't have to tell you how much growth and self-control that shows. But then, but then, because of his act of self-control, Cyril, as a means of being nice to him, uses the shuttle rockets to destroy Barry's ship, trapping Barry in space. Like, look, growth and development for both Cyril and Archer. That's amazing. Oh, and I for before I forget, Trish is played by Brett Butler, and David Fenoy will also be in the two-parter as a recurring guest. Like, the end justifies the means, I guess. It just feels like so much filler, which is just such a shame. A satisfying conclusion to a totally okay adventure. It's like they knew they had to spice up the finale and they send Barry into space, which is a great conclusion to Barry's arc for now, but why not have him just be the big bad right out the gate? Have him take over a space laser or something and they have to go disable the laser while Archer wants one final Star Wars-esque smackdown with him and has to make the same choice. Like, I love Brian Cranston. He's a wonderful voice actor and incredibly talented man, but Commander Davis just felt wholly unnecessary. Space Race is an absolutely orbital and totally fine. Seven out of 10. And there we have it. That's season three. Anything you think I was right on? Wrong on? What was your favorite episode? Least favorite? Let me know in the comments below. And if you liked what you saw, make sure to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And tell your friends we're out here. Double share. It's okay. No one will say anything. Season 3 wasn't as strong as Season 2, but we still got some pretty peak Archer, make no mistake. Season 3 gave us closure in a lot of ways. It forced Archer to move on and grow and showcase that the show can go to space and still never forget its identity. While the season finale wasn't as hard-hitting as either of the ones before it, there was still plenty of heart, outstanding writing, and beautiful voice acting that brought the whole season together as another absolute banger. Like, even at its lowest points, still better than any episode of The Good Family. And in season four, yeah, it's honestly the reference season. If season three is making peace and moving on, season four is the many roads to the future. Where do we go when we're done running from our past? What do we want out of our life? We'll get some good old fashioned Catholic guilt, a cameo by a certain burger flipping badass, and a loving tribute at the bottom of the sea. There's so much more in store when we review season four. Goodbye, everybody. Stand proud. You woke up this morning, and that's no small feat. 
I'm proud of you for getting through the day and know that you can keep fighting.